Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Give you just a second to get there. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Lord, we thank you for this word today. We thank you for the power of your word. I ask you, God, to minister to each and every heart that is here. Let us receive of your word, God. Anoint me to preach this word. Let it go out, God, in the authority that you have given it to me. And help us, I pray, to respond to this word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my message today, title of my message today is The Path of the Backslider. The Path of the Backslider. I've been reading in Revelations for several weeks. Um, I have a book that I... um, Whenever I study Revelations, I read out of this book. It's uh, by Brother Treese. And if you don't know who Brother Treese is, he is passed away, but he is probably one of the greatest uh, of our time knowledgeable men of uh, the old uh, Hebraic and, and Greek language. And uh, he was on the team that deciphered the... Um, the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's it. That's what I was looking for. So he was a part of that team. Um, but this book that he wrote in Revelations is probably the single greatest book that I have ever read in my life concerning the Bible, except for the Bible itself. This book gave me a much broader, clearer understanding of the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations is actually a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And when you read the book of Revelations with that understanding, you will see the whole work of God in its completion. We see God bringing about the final plan of this earth and mankind. And it is a fascinating read. And as I was reading, I came across this passage. It was one that I've heard preached many, many times. I I have heard many sermons out of this passage of Scripture. Um, I, I, many times, and I have preached from this about about that first love and that need for the first love. In fact, Brother Mulliken, I believe, preached from that Scripture at uh, camp this last year. But as I was reading this passage of Scripture... God brought my attention to a pathway. Literally, I saw a pathway. And it was the pathway of the backslider. One who comes in, who walks with Jesus, and then goes out. But the thing that really stuck with me about this pathway that God really brought to my attention was the final portion of the scripture and it says to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God there is a pathway of the backslider 
But the pathway of the backslider is not meant to be a pathway of damnation, but it is meant to be a pathway that will lead the backslider back to Jesus. It's meant to bring mankind back into relationship with him. And he ends this passage with, to he that overcomes, if, if you'll repent, if, if you'll overcome, then I'll bring you back to that place. And there in that place, I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope for the backslider in this passage. It is their pathway back if they will follow it. There is a pathway of the backslider. And I want you to discover with me today this path of the backslider in its three stages. First is the love of the backslider. The second is the lack of love of the backslider. And the third is the love of God towards the backslider. In this pathway, we will see how God is constantly at work in every one, in every person, in every life. He is constantly at work. We will see the hand of God that never, ever lets go of you. It's the will of God that every soul be saved. It does not matter where you are. It does not matter what you've done. It does not matter how far you've backslidden away. There is a love of God that reaches to every man, every woman, every person. And it is never ending. It will never stop. But it must be the will of man that he commits himself to that reaching hand of God that brings him back into repentance. Yes. So I want to look at the first portion of the three things that, we, that I told you we'll discover today. And the first is the love of the backslider. The love yes. of the backslider. Backslider. Now we've used that in Pentecost many times and we've probably heard that in other denominations although that's becoming something that is completely uh, taboo to be heard of in other denominations but it's not a term that we made. This is not a term that mankind gave. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6 you'll realize that that's not a term that mankind came up with. It says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone upon the high mountains and under every green tree and there hath played the harlot. So you see the word backslider originated from God himself. He, he's talking about Israel and he's saying, that this is a people that loved me. This is a people that served me. They are a people that walked with me in righteousness and holiness. But he's saying here that they no longer do that. They have given themselves over to other gods and over to the other, other uh, 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 things. And so because of that, God terms this phrase and he calls those people backsliders. They're backsliders. So God uses that term to describe the position of somebody that was in communion, relationship, and love with him that has now turned their back on him and has walked away. God terms that person to be backslidden. That's what God says. Now, the beginning of the position of backsliding has to begin with coming to God and building a relationship with Him. That's where the position has to begin. The person in their life sees and realizes that they are living in a mess. They are afraid of judgment. They realize that they're going to be condemned for their sins and, and, and that they want to make sure that they are out of that situation. They feel, uh, whatever it might be inside them, a, a, a destitution, a desire, a whatever it might be to get out of that situation. I, I don't like my life. I don't like my situation. I don't like the things that I'm in. Now, Romans 3, chapter 23. 
Unless anybody gets it in their head, uh, some other thing. Let me just tell you this. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I don't care who you are. I, I don't care where you came from. I, it doesn't matter what if you were born and raised in this or not. You're all in that situation. Every one of us found ourselves there. So there isn't a person that can say, well, that applies to somebody else. That's the drunkard, that's the, that's the uh, uh, drug addict, that's the wretched sinner in the, in the gutter that needs to turn to repentance. No, that's everybody. That's everybody. I, I, don't, I don't care if you are uh, 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 raised in a, in a pastor's home, if you're raised in a, in a Pentecostal pew, it doesn't matter. That's us. That's us. So you, everybody comes to Jesus in that place. Yes. It's sin that causes us to be in danger of the judgment of God. Amen. We saw our sins and we saw the need to escape that judgment, every one of us. Amen. That sin in our life brought us to an altar of repentance. Yes. All of us. Amen. We began asking God to forgive us of the things that we had done in our lives. We earnestly sought that he would cleanse us from the things that we had done in our life. We, we feel shame over those things. We, we, are, we, are, uh, we feel the detest of that sin in the presence of God. We, with tear-stained eyes, reach out to God in earnestness, asking him, God, please forgive me for what I've done. Every soul that finds themselves at an altar of repentance does that thing right there. The, the real repentance. The Bible says godly sorrow leadeth unto repentance. It starts with godly sorrow. I have really earnestly got to be repentant, sorrowful for the things that I've done. We felt in that altar, not the anger or wrath of God, but we felt the overwhelming mercy of God. In that moment, there was in our lives, a complete surrender to him. And we were touched by the love of God that surrounded us. It just engulfs you. I watch people as they're up there in the altar or in their pew, wherever they may be, with their hands lifted up in the air, just loving God or, or reaching out to him. Invariably, tears come pouring down their face. And it's tears because of what they feel in the presence of God. For the first time, they feel love. We obeyed God's plan of salvation. We were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. We were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We spoke in tongues and felt the power of God come over us as His Spirit entered into our lives. This entire process is an absolute amazing miracle. I, I'm blown away every time I see this happen. Every time I watch somebody for the first time raise their hands and begin to worship God. Destiny, it was the most beautiful thing to watch you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost over there. It, it, it was so amazing. Each time I've seen somebody receive it, just as God begins to take hold of their tongue and you see that tongue just begin to loose and begin to speak words that they don't have control of or know or understand. That is an absolute miracle. It's an absolute miracle. Every time it happens, it's just an absolute miracle. It's the most beautiful thing in the kingdom. Did you know and did you realize that every time that that happens, there's a party in heaven? There's a party in heaven. The angels rejoice over a sinner that comes to repentance. It's, it's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. The love of the backslider, this is the part we're talking about, is to Jesus. This is the first stage. They fall in love with Jesus, the love of the backslider. There is a change in their countenance. There is a change in their attitude as they fall in love with Jesus. That, that person begins to do whatever it is that God asks them to do. There are things that they stop doing. There are things that they start doing. When you enter a relationship with Jesus, let, let me just say this, that a lot of people look at the church and they say, well, 
I, 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 I understand what you believe. I, I feel the presence of God, all of this, but I just don't think that I can do all of that. You, you're misunderstanding something altogether. God is not requiring you to do all of that. Just step back for a moment and realize that God does not expect you to go from zero to a hundred like that. It doesn't happen like that. We are born into the kingdom. There are children that are born. When they're birthed, we don't expect them to do calculus and, and run a mile in a minute and, 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 and do all of that stuff. We realize that the development of a child has to take time over the course. But we do expect that that child eventually will learn to sit up on its own and walk and read and then do the things that an adult would do. But it takes time. And so everybody that, that looks at this, you're misunderstanding something that God is just birthing you into the kingdom. He's patient. Sometimes people are stupid and they're not patient. But as long as I'm pastor of this church, we will be patient. We'll be patient. We're in no hurry. We are in no hurry. You're going to grow. You're going to mature. But... The relationship begins with a love for Jesus, a love for him. And then it begins as we walk closer to him. They begin moving closer to Jesus. You see them and they're coming early for church. They're, they're, they can't wait till the church doors open and they're, they're the first ones in. When, when altar hits, man, they're the first ones in the altar and they're the last ones to leave the altar. Man, there's just this love. Oh God, I, I, I need this. I, I want this. I desire this. There's just a love for Jesus. They're so full of thankfulness and gladness for the things that he has done for us. Oh God, that, that we could return to that sometimes. That, that when we know the doors are open, man, we're just the first ones in and the last ones to leave the altar. But God has transformed that person, and, and they have a love for Jesus. It's genuine. It's something that's real in their life. And this person has a love and a desire to be pleasing to God. It's the driving force of their life. That's what they want. That's what they desire. That's the hunger that they have. But now the second phase that we're going to talk about is the lack of love. There was the love of the backslider, and now there is the lack of love. Along the way, something happens. It could be months after they are saved. It, it could be many years later. It could be that they're a, a, a child that was born in the church and raised their whole life in the church. Doesn't matter when. Doesn't matter how. It, it just starts with a lack of love. Something happens to them and it changes their mind. There comes in the life of that person a lack of love. What once was an honest and pure love for God gets tarnished some way. The love is not as strong. The love is not as compelling. It doesn't take first place in my life. It's needful. It's necessary. It's something that I want. But it's not first it just begins to get marked down the line. Okay, I, I, the path of the backslider. Now, Eve dealt with this issue. She was made to question the love of God. The devil came to her and enticed her, and through that enticement, she changed her thought pattern about God, and she looked at God with different lenses. She saw him in a different light. And it changed her perception of God. It, it caused a lack of love in Eve's heart. And because she had a lack of love, Eve fell. Now the scripture is full of warnings and of reasons for backsliding. Jesus taught a parable about the word of God being sown in the lives of people's hearts. The seed grew in three out of the four occasions. It did something in three out of the four. Now that's powerful. That ought to tell you something about the Word of God. But in only one occasion was the seed fruitful. Only one. Jesus 
said the seed failed in the others because of issues in their lives. They were glad at receiving the seed and it grew, but offenses came, Jesus said, and the seed withered. Now people backslide all the time because of offenses. They allow what someone did in their life to cause them to get bitterness or anger or hurt or whatever it might be, and they turn their idea, their concept, their view, their look at Jesus. They do. It causes the love that they had for Jesus to be a lack of love for him. Now, if there isn't a more foolish thing in all of the world than this kind of lack of love, man, I don't get it. I don't get it. Scott does something to me, and it makes me angry, so I quit loving my wife. Is that stupid? Somebody hurts me, and because they hurt me, I get angry, and I stop loving Jesus. But over and over and over and over and over again, this happens. Well, that church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, and look what they're doing. It changes the concept and the eyesight from, I love you, Jesus. I love all of these people. I love everything that happens in here. To, uh, I'm, I'm kind of lacking a little love here. You see how, how, how offense comes. Now, offense, let me... In case anybody does not know, let me just let, help you to understand. Jesus said, offenses will come. So you're going to be offended. I'm going to be offended. I have been offended and I have offended others. Others have hurt me and I have hurt other people. It's just life. I've been married to my wife for 34 years. She has hurt me and I have hurt her. We've done things that have offended each other. But when it comes to Jesus, for some reason... People backslide because of offenses. <clears throat> the path to backsliding is paved with offenses. Don't let that happen to you. Just do not let offenses happen to you. I, I, I love you all. I care about every one of you. But I'm going to offend you. Please forgive me. I don't mean to do it. I am not setting out to offend anybody else. I have to allow you to offend me. I have to. Because I've got to learn to forgive. If we can't learn to forgive, then we'll never be able to walk with Jesus. That's, that's just the way it is. You cannot learn to forgive if you're not offended. Sorry. You can't learn patience unless you're stuck in a construction line. Just the way it is. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. Backsliding. Why do people backslide? Because they receive not a love for truth. Paul said that people will backslide because they don't love the truth. They love the presence of God. They love the mercy of God. They love everything about God, but they don't love the truth. They, they don't love it. They, the word of God becomes an offense to them, or it becomes a limitation. It becomes this fence that will not let them out to enjoy life. There was just something about the truth that they themselves never fell in love with. They never got themselves into the Word of God. This is a danger of Pentecostal kids growing up in the church. They, 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 they hear the truth. They, are, are, they can memorize the Bible. They can do it. But to love the truth. Love the truth. They, they don't learn to love the truth. They never for themselves got into the word of God and sought it out for themselves. When I became, uh, when I became a, uh, an adult, when I was 17, 18 years old, I began to question the doctrine that we teach. 
I began to ask God because I was around a lot of people that had a lot of other doctrines and they were telling me stuff and they were giving me uh, all kinds of, of scripture and it's like, okay God, I've got to know for myself whether or not what I've been taught all my life is true. And so I got into the scripture and I began to look for myself. And I begin to look to see, do you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Must you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be saved? Must I live a repentant, which means a life that is pleasing to God every day of my life to be saved? And I looked, and I looked in Romans, I looked in Corinthians, I, I looked in Ephesians, I looked everywhere. And what I found was I found Paul saying that you've got to live a righteous life. You've got to live a holy life. I found that the, the, the church in Ephesus was founded upon them receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, them being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. I saw that Paul himself, Paul himself, was baptized in Jesus' name, and he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I found it over and over again in, my, in, in the Bible. Yes. And so for myself, I looked into the scriptures. I found for myself, yeah. and it became, it became rooted in me. Yeah. It became rooted in me. And, and when, I, when I got an understanding of the scripture, then everything that I looked through with, with my eyes, I saw through that viewpoint yeah. of the gospel. Yeah. But people will backslide because they have not a love for the truth. Paul dealt with this in his writings. He rebuked the Galatian church. He said, oh, Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You should follow another doctrine, which is not a doctrine. Paul spoke to the Corinthian church. He, he spoke to the Ephesian church. He spoke to the Philippians. He, he, on and on and on. Paul dealt with people that were constantly having to fight false doctrine. And he constantly tried to make them realize the necessity of truth, of loving truth. Stay in the truth. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other doctrine than what we have told you, let them be accursed. He was so foundational strong on we've got to love the truth. He fought that. He fought that. There, there were so many. He said there are going to come people that are, that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're going to begin to preach to you doctrines that are of the devil. They, they are teachers having itching ears. They're going to preach to people that just want to hear good things told to them. That only want to know about the love and mercy of God. And, the, and, and, and only want to be told that they can live any lifestyle that they want to be and still be saved. And Paul said, that's, you've got to realize that that's going to come up. And you've got to stay away from that. And so people that love Jesus and came to Jesus with an honest and sincere heart for whatever reason because of a lack of love of truth, were deceived and, and, and walked away. Jesus spoke in our opening scripture. He said, you left your first love. I believe that Jesus was speaking about him because before I can love the truth, I, I got to love him. People walk away because they simply stop loving Jesus. My first love was Jesus Christ. Any manner of, of, of love has in, in Christianity has to begin with Him. Lack of love in the backslider can come from what James described. He said in James 1, 14-15, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when love hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Lack of love in the backslider often happens because of the enticement of sin and the world around us. Young Pentecostals fall to this continually. Raised to know and love God. I'm talking about there was love. We're, we're looking at the path of the backslider. It can happen many ways. But in many ways it's because of the allurement of sin that is out there. 
They, they see the things that are out there and, and they, they, they get to work with other young people. They get to be around others in school. They get to be around those things and the questions start coming up. We're, we're going to go over here and do that. Would you like to come? And the young Pentecostal youth has to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't go. Well, why? And then all of a sudden, that, 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 that wall of truth that was around them becomes not a guard to keep the world out, but it becomes a prison cell that just keeps them in. And they, 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 the lack of love begins to happen in the youth. They look at the world and they say, but that looks like fun, but that looks like it would be good, but that looks like it would be appealing. And even those that walk into the church and for the first time, they have come out of the sin of the, of the world and they walk into the church and they walk with Jesus and they love him. And over a period of time, those things that were out there start calling again. And before we know it, that passion that when we stood in the front of the church and we had our hands lifted high and the tears running down our face and that love for Jesus, oh God, I need you. And oh God, you are everything to me. Now, all of a sudden, when we get into the house of God, it's, I, I, I don't feel it so strong. It's just not there. It just, it starts to become a lack of love. There is love but the path of the backslider turns to lack of love. However you want to put it there, offense, uh, 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 allurement of the world, uh, lo uh, not loving the truth. Jesus said, because iniquity abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It, it just happens. It's a lack of love. Before you know it, they're gone. They walk away and they leave behind everything that they were taught. They take the precious life that God has for them and they throw it in the trash. The path of the backslider is many. But it always results in a lack of love. It started with loving Jesus, but in time, however long that time might be, it results in a lack of love for Him. Not loving the truth, not loving Jesus, and turning our love back towards the world. That's the second phase. Talking about the path of the backslider. This isn't a hopeless situation. So the backslider loved Jesus, turned their love from Jesus. But there's something you forgot. But there's something that you're missing here. He never turned his love from them. He never changed his attitude towards them. He never one time said, you're gone. You're away from me. There isn't one time that God ever said, for the path of the backslider is a one-way road. It is not a one-way road. There is hope for the backslider. There is hope for those that have turned their heart away. There is hope. The love of God towards the backslider. Here is where God spoke to me as I was reading this portion of the book of Revelation. Who knows how people get to that position of the backslider. It, it, it sometimes is beyond my understanding. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. Every one of them at one time loved God and every one of them, every one of them at some time had a desire to please Him. But every one of them at some point and for some reason turned their hearts away. It resulted in them going back to their original position of judgment. They stand again in the place that if God comes and they die, they will be in the judgment of God for their sins. They stand back in in that same place. Yet this is not the place that God desires for them to be in. This is not the place that God wants them to be in. It is not the position that God has ever determined that their life should stay in. If you look through your Bible, you will see 
the everlasting love of God towards his people, towards the backslider. If you look in the book of Hosea, it is an absolute story of the life of a man that God used to show us how God loves the backslider, how God is determined to reach the backslider. If you look at the prophets, you will see that God is constantly sending his word, sending his prophet, sending his love, reaching with his hand to the backslider. He won't leave them alone. He will not leave them alone. He won't leave them alone. You loved me at one time. We had a beautiful relationship. I filled you with my spirit. You gave to me the, the passion of your heart towards me. I filled you and touched you and healed you. This is more than a calling to the lost. This is more than a, a love that God, God loves every man. You've got to understand that. God loves the lost. But there is something about the backslider. We had a relationship. You loved me and I loved you. We were so intimate at one point. But you pulled back from me. And I can't stand that. You know the way to walk. You know the way of truth. You were my son. You were my daughter. And I loved you with everything that I have. And I'll stand in the window. And I'll look down the road. Because I'm waiting on you. And I won't give up on you. And I will not stop my hand reaching to you. You've got to understand for the backslider. There is something that is more powerful. More earnest in the hand of God. Read in your Bible. He doesn't send the prophet over to other countries and other nations. He sends them back to Israel. You're my beloved. You're my child. You're my bride. You're my people. I'm reaching for you. I won't give up on you. I, I, I could wipe you off the face of the earth. He could just wipe Israel completely off the face of the earth and said, I don't need you. I send one prophet to Syria and the whole country. In, in one prophet, the whole country falls on their face from the king to the lowest. They don't even let the animals eat. I could raise up Syria and they could be my people. And they, but God does not want that. He keeps reaching back to Israel. Come on, come back to me. Come on, turn your heart back to me. I'll forgive you. I'll, I'll wash you whiter than snow. He even says... Oh, Israel, what, what, what shall I do with you? I have engraven you upon my hands. Don't you understand? Oh, God, I feel your burden this morning. <laughs> Somebody has walked away from God and he has not given up on them and he has not turned the door away from them and he will never until they breathe their last breath God has a path for the backslider. And that path always leads back to him. Oh, it always, it always, it always leads back to him. I don't know who's listening online today. I, I don't know who will watch this after this service today. I don't know who you are in this house today. I don't know what you deal with. I don't know what's going in your life. I don't know where you are. I just know this, that God is determined first and foremost to never let you backslide. Okay. That your heart would never turn from him. That the, that the hunger that is inside you that you had when you first came to him and your heart poured out to him and you wept and you cried before him and there was an openness between you and him but somehow something has gotten in the way and there's a wall between you and God and it's become it's caused you to become a little bit colder than you used to be and it's caused you to be a little bit further than what you want to be God is reaching to you and God is saying to you I am the one that cleansed you I am the one that healed you I am the one that raised you up and I love you don't turn from me don't turn from me. Don't turn from me. You don't know where you're headed. 
You don't know what you're headed to. You don't know the pain that's of, uh, that is right around the corner from you. Stop making the decisions that you're making. Stop doing the things that you're doing. Turn your heart back to me. Where, are, where is the one that loved me? Where is the one that was on their face before me? Where is the one that loved me? Because I haven't stopped loving you. And God is saying, I want to stop you from the road that you're on. I want to turn you back to me. But to that one that walked away, to that one that is not here, and there are many, God is saying, would you turn? Would you turn? Would you take your heart would you take your life? Would you take your spirit and come back to me? I will not reject you. I will not throw you in the trash. If you'll come back to me, we don't have to start all over again. We don't have to start from ground zero. I will put you back where you were at. And I will take you from there and we will go forward. God is saying that to the one that is backslidden and to the one that is not here. God is reaching. I'm telling you, God is reaching. In these last days, God is reaching for backsliders. In these last days, Jesus is about to come. God is about to show himself in the heavens. And there will be an archangel that will give a trumpet sound. And those that are dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. But before he comes, God is reaching to the back. Slider. God is reaching to those that he has filled with his presence. God is reaching to those that he has given his mercy and grace and showered in love. God is reaching to the backslider. Because there's a path. There's a path for the backslider. And it leads back to his throne. It leads back to his throne. To his throne. Jesus gives to every man this promise. And I, I tell you today, I saw, as I read that scripture, I saw this pathway. And it ended right here. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. God is saying, if you'll just turn, if you'll just turn, if you'll just make that step back towards me, then I will renew you. I will make my relationship with you brand new. If you'll repent, I'll come back to you. We'll renew our relationship and I'll give you the right. I'll give you the right to eat of the tree of life. God is calling the backslider. Can we, call, can we stand today? I sat at home. I have a prayer rug and every morning I place myself down on that prayer rug and I begin to pray. And as I prayed over that prayer rug, the faces of those that used to be here, I saw them one by one. People that were a part of us love this truth people that helped us in building this church they painted walls they put tile on the floors they cleaned out closets they, they sat in these pews and I saw all those faces and I thought oh God Where would they be today? Some of them have divorced. Some of them have gone on to other things, but none of them have ever gotten any better. Maybe they left because they were offended. Maybe they left because they didn't love the truth. Maybe they left because of the allurement of sin. I don't know. 
but this much I know there is a place at the table of God for them and you stand here today and there are those in your lives that you love and you care about so very much and you want to see them walking in truth and they were a part of this but they walked away there is hope today there is hope today, but somebody has got to intercede. Maybe you're here today and there's just been a little wall between you and Jesus and that, that hunger, that passion, that desire that, that you had inside of you when, when you felt his presence is just not there today. Then I, I ask you, would you come? Would you pray? Would you place your life before the altar for that one that is backslidden? Would you cry out? Would you call out that God would reach and bring in the path of that backslider back to the place that they need to be? Be that intercessor in this house.